Nope. Uh, nope. No one cares. So 2011 was a uh, a fine year for everyone in InfoSec, I'm sure. Everything went smoothly. There were no bumps in the road, except for a few things. Um, so, so in uh, March, my sequel. Uh, I think they actually had two breaches this year in some different way, but um, the dump of MySQL data from MySQL from a SQL injection, I believe, uh, off their site. That was in March. Uh, Barracuda, probably when Zach was there, maybe. Uh, that seems likely. <laughs> so the Barracuda one was even more interesting because to, to their plausible defense, they said, well, we actually had our WAF in front of the network where this was all going on and where we got owned. However, it was down for a maintenance cycle at that time. So their SQL injection that was just gratuitous, uh, apparently they were trusting their WAF that they couldn't actually keep patched in a regular interval to, uh, to, to be the one be all end all to their security. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, yeah, but usually you have failover, uh, or you just you know do other processes than one product, right? Bruce Schneier, process not product. Um, so in the case of Barracuda, if they're trying to give best practices to clients, it seems kind of funny that they would take down a laugh and that would let them get owned. Komodo starting the SSL 2011 uh, cycle. Um, you guys probably know pretty much all you need to know about Komodo. Um, obviously, DigiNotar and um, who are our recent friends that got owned? The, yeah, DigiCert. Yep. Yeah, what was that like 26 certs or something? And then yeah, and then uh, there was a, the um, what was that Malaysian one that was found? But what was, it, what was it for that was just found recently that was in the wild, though? It had been signed for like two years. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it Ta Taiwan or Malaysia? I don't know. I didn't hear what it was at, but. Yeah, there was a malware with a valid um, government signed cert of like Malaysia or Taiwan or something. And it, it, it's expired now, but it was valid for two years. So <laughs> that's not good. Uh, PBS, you know, who really screws with PBS, honestly? It's like, oh, public broadcasting, let's take those guys down. Um, so yeah, they got hit twice uh, consecutively month in or consecutive months. The you know these are all quotes obviously from releases. Um, the quote at the bottom makes me laugh a little bit more than the top one. Their statement, PBS's statement, was a very small number of administrative names and encrypted passwords. I I don't know how many. Yeah, exactly. How many uh, administrative accounts until it's like oh it's a problem. <laughs> here's here's four or five you can pick from. Just in case one has a weaker, you know, hash value. <laughs> and Citigroup, um, that was especially for a banking institution. That, that even though it's city, even city's terrible. But you know, for the fact that you basically could do a URL edit and you could start stealing information from accounts. Sony, you know, it, it it was hard just to pick one because I think there were like 35 or something across all of their brands that they own. Um, but I thought that one was interesting partly because of my experience working at ePrize. You know, those codes, it, it's not just like, oh, these digital codes got, you know, owned and you can't use them. You know, those things are printed. They have to pull them off shelves. They have to reprint. They have to, it, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of money lost for these kinds of situations when you're do, doing the digital promotions like that. So, um, but yeah, Sony didn't escape very well this year. So, um, you know, and this is going back to the InfraGuard thing. You know, they, they've all been talking about APT left and right, uh, PLA, China scary, right? Uh, Al-Qaeda Al is always, you know, for the last decade, the malicious insider from every CISP book I had to read recently. <laughs> so, and then obviously, we got owned by WallSec, right? So, the poor web programming, if you look at all of those examples and then the other you know, 100 this year that was pub that were publicized. Um, the web programming is just, I don't know, abhorrent maybe that's out there, especially for companies like the Citibanks and like the Barracudas and, my, and for the MySQLs that should know what they're doing technically. Um, so the wannabe a hacker, so, you know, here's this awesome check. Yeah, you want to you be a hacker, right? Well, that, yeah, yeah contracting rate, right? Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, so so really, like, it comes down to what did they do wrong? Like, what what here isn't right when they when they wrote this check to me? You get to all that blank space. It goes to one hundred to a thousand million. Oh, my Lord. So it, it's interesting because that example is completely analogous to what we do every day, right? Um, everyone in this room and most people in general, after like a high school business class or you know, maybe your parents, you know not to leave blank space on a check. You know to you know, put a lie, you know to fill it in so that there's not extra room for people to alter it. That's pretty straightforward. Um, so, but then we look at something like this. In this example, it's the same thing. Obviously, one's front and back end type situation with uh, you know SQL injection. But at the at the same point, we're letting them control the details, just like we let them control the details on the check. So we know what to do. We know how to protect against these things, but we're still not doing them for some obscene reason. So checks and websites. It, this is one of those things that I just kind of like had a moment. I'm like, yeah, that that makes sense. They're pretty much the same. So I mean, if you think about it, you have certain parameters. Um, if you don't fill in the parameters correctly, or if you leave room, or if you do you know, X, Y, and Z, there's the opportunity to inject things or to um, you know, leverage that for your own needs. OK, this is probably going to be a lot of regurgitation for you guys. Um, so I am more often than not, right, it's just there's a lot of details, and unless you pay attention to the ones that matter, there's going to be some way to get owned in some in some manner. Even even with a check, I mean, maybe you fill in one correctly. I had a check that got a friend of mine was just filling out, and um, they wrote the wrong uh, amount on the or on the written line, but they wrote the right amount in the numerical area. And when the bank cashed it, they cashed it for the value of the written line. So yeah, I, so it's it's one of those things like yeah, I mean even if someone screwed up or if if they left a little room on one or the other, you'd be like, well, you know, please they they meant to do this. It's right here, obviously. And um, same thing with SQL injection or any kind of web attack is we're we're letting them do this and for not a lot of good reason. So other bad things, you know, LFI, LFD, authentication bypass, and lack of crypto. Um, you know, I mean, these things aren't to be like shrugged off, obviously, but the SQL injection is really, I don't know, it, I think it's the most prevalent because everyone and their sister wants a dynamic website now. So because of that, we have a lot of people that are shoehorning in dynamic aspects to websites that are probably good enough static except for one or two you know, pages. But we make everything SQL based now. Everything has to have a database behind it for no reason. So we have our... Uh, Basically, there are two steps, right? Um, all input, anytime a user can input anywhere, should be validated and or sanitized. Sometimes the sanitization, when you're accepting an input, um, you know, I know people uh, at different companies, they take everything in. They never leave any data out. They always take it in, and then they encode it, obviously, and they, they protect themselves where they need to. But they always take all the data in, in case they have to pull something out of it later. Um, so some people sanitize, some people validate and sanitize. but as long as you're checking the input to make sure that it can't hurt you, even if the data is corrupt, as long as it's not going to affect your business processes, it's not going to affect logic, it's not going to influence output, um, it really doesn't matter at that point. And then the third party products, you know, Barracudas laugh, I, I don't have anything bad to say about it, um, but it, you know, it really comes back down to there are options between commercial and free and Whatever you pick, you should at least put in mind that if you have to support it and you have to do a maintenance cycle and you have to patch these things, um, if your company can't take down your website while you do that, then maybe you have to look at an HA type option or something else that offers what you need. So, and then here's my de facto Duo slide. Everyone, everyone in here has used or seen Duo, right? Okay, thank God. Are you serious? Oh man. That's awesome. Uh, well, we can yeah, we can do a little duo demo maybe later then. I was. You there? Yeah, he's. Yeah, was he the guy who's walked with the gym? 
<laughs> so as I'm currently finishing up um, my master's degree, this uh, about a month from today, actually, um, you know, we we it's been an evolutionary thing, right? So, uh, for instance, pharmacists. My fiance is a pharmacist, and I asked her when I was writing this presentation, like, so you know, pharmacy that's been regulated for like hundreds of years, and there's always been like restrictions and this and that. And she's like, no, really, since about maybe like 1950. She's like, you know, things were pretty fast and loose before then. Um, even you know. 10 years ago, things were still pretty open-ended, um, unlike they are now, which everything's locked down to a T, um, at least to make our life hell it is. So you, you take something like a pharmacist who impacts lives, obviously, at a, at a medical, you can kill someone if you don't do your job. Um, lawyers, obviously, all these professions that have had lots and lots and lots of years of school. Now, I know people in here probably have a high school diploma and, and no more. And I mean, that's fine, obviously. I mean, people are very successful without them. The thing is, there are people that are successful without them, and there are people that do things that put them in a position to be powerful without the education, whether it's self-trained or vocational or uh, you know proper college education, and they're not getting the background to understand the the you know gravity of what they're programming and how it's going to affect people, and you know certain business processes that are going to use this for a decade, and they think it's going to be up there for a month. So and the other thing is we don't have any kind of licensing. We have no way to say. Yeah, this person wrote terrible code. It got our company. It got millions of people's records, uh, you know, PII, PHI released because of their incompetence, their negligence, their lack of, you know, due, you know, due care. There's no way to track that. They just change it on their resume. They say everything went swimmingly. Hope they don't get a reference call. And you know, you go to the, they go to the next place, and maybe they repeat it. So obviously, I mean, it, it really is sort of an apples and oranges situation. Um, you know, one has real impact in terms of you can kill someone. However, I mean, to, to anyone who's had their identity stolen, um, a good friend of mine had his stolen a few years back, the loss of real time, real money, and I mean, it's, it's not unheard of for people to just lose it after they've had their identity stolen or their credit report ruined or this or that. I mean, people do kill themselves for stuff that people are stealing online and using against them. Um, so there are consequences, maybe not as direct, but it's still something that we should take seriously because that you know there are millions of people's lives that are entrusted to us whenever we put a single line of code somewhere with their data. Um, you know, not not so differently. You know, every profession that we're talking about, whether it's medical or, or law or our professions, um, we're expected to handle clients, right? Um, we're not expected to lie to our clients. We're not expected to um, you know pretend like we know something we don't. And the thing is, it's very easy in InfoSec and very easy in IT in general to lie your way through. As long as you can fool the person above you, you can get advanced to positions that you may should really should have never had any kind of reason being part of. Um, there aren't board exams. There's no licensing. Like I said, um, you know, it took my fiance an accelerated program six years to be a pharmacist, um, like seven or eight rotations. I mean, it, it takes a lot of effort to get to the point where you could hurt someone. In our case, there is no point. There's just, if you lie really well, you social engineer people, you possibly could get to a position where you're running things with millions of people's you know, data. Yeah. Um, so in, in each case, you know, the professional, you, know, you have the Hippocratic Oath and other, other aspects to most professions where you deal with so much personal information and, and so much gravity within the context of what you can do to affect a person's life if you don't do the right thing. Um, you know, we have CISSP, we have, you know, certified ethical, ethical hacker, we have all these things that are guiding principles. I mean, we have RFCs about netiquette, we have RFCs about, um, you know, proper handling of data. I, none of these, they may be standards to us in a kind of general way, but they're not the same kind of ethical standards that people, when they have their career, they they have to adhere to, otherwise someone's going to take away their license or or you know um, make them retake the the bar exam or other things that we just don't have to go through in, in IT and infosec. And to be fair, I mean I've made a shit ton of mistakes in my career on situations that probably could have screwed up data or released data or other bad things. I, it, there's just too many opportunities not to. Um, now in all of those other careers we looked at, the medical, the law. If you do something bad, it will follow you. 
if you do things that are negligent, it will follow you. Um, you just can't erase history because you're, ups, you're, you know, you're unhappy with that last job and you, know, you, you foobarred once. So in web programming, there, there isn't that. There's no real long-term accountability. Um, it's just job to job and hope for the best. So, the, and this is coming from a, I've been programming for 10 years, especially web applications, and I've, I've, I have websites up still that take in credit card information and stuff like that. So, the thing about web programmers, we get full, unfettered access to databases where there's data that we probably shouldn't even have. The reason why is because the, the DBA, honestly, for most smaller businesses and smaller companies, is usually the web programmer too. There's, there's very rarely in small business a, a separation of duties between the DBA and the web programmer, um, mostly because every single web programmer these days obviously uses databases. So it's like, oh yeah, I can write that. I can build the database. I know how to make a, you know, a schema in my SQL. So we let them do that, and now there's no way to say, are we giving too much access to this person because there's no other person to you know, restrict that access. Um, checks and balances. A lot of these websites, a lot of these situations, um, you know, management for some things in IT are, I, I think, easier to kind of see things are going well, things aren't going well. When you start looking at code and you don't know that language or you don't know how to program, um, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, this looks legit. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not really what we're doing, but what it looks like to the person who has to judge it. Um, so if the website looks nice, that, that means it, it, and it, and it works, and you fill out a form, and it does something that they're expecting it to do, everything's peachy. There's no like, oh, well, what if we did this here and this here, and what if someone input this there? You know, you're looking for an end result. You're not looking for all the subtle details. Um, documentation's a joke in web programming. I don't know a, a, a piece of code I've ever worked on that was properly documented. Um, even code I have out there, I'm not sure all of it's properly documented, honestly. I always tried. But I'm sure there's stuff that is live right now that has no documentation behind it. When you think of influencing um, how, uh, how business logic and how um, applications run, the, the programmer, the web guy, he's taking all the input in and giving all the input out. He controls the entire flow of data uh, in almost all cases. So you have a website that, that's public. It doesn't matter what this guy did. Maybe he was working on a website for, uh, you know, some membership thing. Well, the membership database or the membership table happened to be in a shared database, or maybe multiple databases were on the same SQL connection or something. Now you might have given privilege to something that person never has even seen or heard of, because they didn't know what they were doing, and it kind of trickles down. And now you have access to a database um, that's completely irrelevant to the website you're visiting, but the access is there nonetheless to you know, pull up data and do whatever you want. And realistically, um, especially with PHP, and I hate to pick on PHP because I did it for 10 years, but um, PHP has evolved really oddly, I think. If you think of something like um, Ruby on Rails, Rails is a, it, it's really Model 2, it's not MVC, it's a Model 2 framework on top of Ruby. Um, People really didn't program uh, a lot of web apps in Ruby until Rails came out. Rails protects you from shooting yourself in the foot in most situations unless you do really stupid stuff. So there's already that layer of abstraction from you know, ruining simple processes by just not knowing what you're doing. Um, in PHP, it took a lot of years to get a valid Model 2 or a valid MVC framework out there that people would actually use. Everyone would write their own database abstraction library. Everyone would write their own validation library. You always just wrote everything from scratch. Some people would use a couple pair project, you know, packages, but um, in general, you know, PHP was a lot more organic. How you learned, you learned by like writing a cookbook. You learned by writing a, you know, a music database inventory system. I, these aren't business applications, but those same people go from writing those simple code, um, that simple code that has no real concern about information assurance and now they're writing applications that do, and they don't know how to you know, bridge that gap themselves. So does anyone know of a four-year degree in web programming around here, or even not around here? Does anyone know of? <laughs> yeah. 
so yeah, I mean, so it comes down. I mean, I, I did you know try to look and try to find them. I, I think I found a couple, but I wasn't even sure if those were really a true four-year degree. Um, you'll usually see certificates of achievement. That's what you'll see, which is basically equivalent to an associate's degree vocationally, more or less. Um, a lot of community colleges have a, a program. Um, if you look at the curriculum, and I kind of just did a quick dive in, in curriculum for a bunch of the ones around Michigan, um, security is often like a piece of one course. It's not a course. It's not multiple semesters. It's usually one half of you know one piece of a, a, a lab book or something. So you'll say something like, oh yeah, you have to secure inputs. And then you have two years in, you know, or 2.27, or two years and like that seven tenths of a, of a semester of there may be something about security, you should probably think about that. Um, it's not something that's ingrained in people. I mean, we have IA programs, right? The IA programs, whether or not they're good, um, they at least make an emphasis on security for each and every topic. It's Windows with an emphasis on IA. It's Linux with an emphasis on IA. It's networking with IA. Uh, with web programming, you just don't get that. And that's for people, if you don't mind jumping in, for people who are just coming through get security. People like, for example, in IT, who've been you know, 10, 15, 20 years out of college, there was no security back then. They never, they never even mentioned it. Right, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, you're really not going to find very many, um, if any, <laughs> bachelor's programs in web application. So you'll probably find a comp sci degree that may have a concentration or a partial concentration in web development um, as far as four years ago. Even then, looking at like U of, M, uh, U of M, looking at some of the stuff Eastern has and other colleges around here, it's super minimal. It, maybe there's three classes. And again, of those three classes of web development, you have a, a chapter on security. So I mean, web applications aren't the only thing. Um, it, it's really just a way people take web development not very seriously at, I don't know if it's a management level or institutionally, depending on where you're at. Um, you know, at 22, I had two different live websites on two different Michigan University website, you know, web servers, public facing. It wasn't like an uh, internet type thing. So it, it's like, OK, well, you know, you guys know me somewhat. You know I have some knowledge of security, obviously. However, that doesn't mean these people that let me do this had any idea. There wasn't a security review process. No one looked at my code. No one did an audit. No one asked me questions about what it does or what it accesses. No one ever asked, oh, do you do web development? Does anyone pay you to do this professionally? Does, what you know, basic credential do you have to put this on our network? Uh, I've never taken a web programming class in my entire life. <laughs> And the, the really concerning thing here is there's, this is not at any means the exception. This is the everyday reality. Um, you know, so many people got into web development, especially in the last 10 years, because PHP made it so damn easy that the web development side of things is just, if you think about the learning curve of PHP versus most other languages or ones that have established frameworks, PHP is like the beacon of hope to people that have never programmed because they go, yeah, I can make a database website you know, in five minutes. And that's the great thing about PHP and that's the worst thing about PHP. So it really comes down to smoke and mirrors to me. Um, they, the people that are managing the people and the people that are hiring the people that are writing these websites that are just terrible and that release this data, it, it really doesn't come down to what is the code doing. It comes down to what do I see the code doing? Hey, GeoCities was all static. They, they, they did things right. <laughs> Getting the iframe, that's the worst part you could do in GeoCities. Some of the backgrounds were a crime. You know, we used to, oh yeah, we used to do all sorts of fun stuff with JavaScript and GeoCities. Well, it's, it's, it's all front, you know, yeah, I, I guess the front end side, but I'm, I'm oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, they're not going to be breaking into the GeoCities like corporate network from, right, you know, their right, static. Right, right. <laughs> um, Go ahead, keep blaming the man. There you go. Yep. So uh, I told you everyone does their bad job horribly. Um, <laughs> oh well, I guess you want to take it there. Um, so uh, 
the, the next point, and this is where things get kind of hairy, is, I mean, even experienced programmers will push things out to make deadlines, to make their bosses happy, to, you know, just get shit done. Um, and it, it's, that weird, it's that weird situation where you have people that maybe they're writing a business report, and they have to spend extra hours, they have to get it on to a deadline. At the end of the day, that business report's going to be seen by the manager. They're going to know exactly what it does because they can read it. They understand the business report. They know if it sucks or not. When you're pushing out code really fast and your manager wants a website to have a certain widget for iTunes, they just want to see that widget for iTunes. They don't care how you got it done. They don't care what it looks like on the back end. And so there's, there's this disparity there within how you can manage someone if you're not completely in-depth with the work they're actually producing. Um, and it only takes one mistake to really screw your whole application. Yeah, absolutely. The inexperienced programmers, for better or for worse, they don't know they're making bad decisions. They didn't have an education in this. They didn't read the right website to get the best education. They didn't go to the conference to hear someone talk about web app vulnerabilities. They're not a member of OWASP. They have no idea what OWASP is. There you go. And they're getting paid for it. Yeah. So, it, I mean, you can always blame someone for being ignorant, but man, there's just... It's it's hard to it's hard to just bash people because they're trying to do a job that they think they're doing well. They're getting good results. They're getting lauded by their peers and by their manager. Why would they think they're doing anything bad? So, between the year review stuff, between looking at how our industry and how we're depending on where we are in our positions, aren't really helping people get to where they need to be. Um, we, you know, we probably should actually do something. <laughs> So the managers, <laughs> for your developers, you shouldn't ask them, how should we be programming? You should be telling them how they should be programming. Um, having been an employee, having had a manager, and having programmed, I was always the person that had to dictate what my coding style was, what frameworks I would leverage, what libraries I would include, what security practices I'd adhere to. Um, that should be coming from top down because top down has accountability now. If I don't do it, I'm not doing my job. If I'm do if I'm not doing something I was never told to, you know, whose fault is it now? Um, the auditing part gets hairy because everyone thinks audit in terms of like we're going to have people I don't know like wolf you know in here for days and days and days and months and years. Um, what it really should come down to is you know there's companies. There, there are a lot of companies, not not the Price Waterhouse Coopers, not you know, not the the, the Deloitte's, companies like Networks Groups or or um, MNX Solutions, where I used to work, that would oh, there you go, that will come in, take a look at your code base, um, you know, if they've done it, if they've looked at your code base before, you know, they can, hopefully, you have some kind of version control, which again should be another you know top down thing. If they can look at your commit logs from the last audit they did to now. I mean, as far as time and money goes, there's a pretty easy way to handle that as long as you're not doing millions of lines. You know, if you're if you're at MLOC, as far as code development, you should have someone in-house doing the audits. But if you're doing thousands of lines of code over a couple months, you know, getting audited, you know, I've looked at thousands of lines of code in a single day and audited and given a report by the end of the day. So um, it's definitely viable, right? The developers. This is something I don't see enough, and, and maybe it's because a lot of times when you're doing web development, you're usually on a team of one. Um, you know, it, obviously, I'm kind of abstracting this from the corporate culture. You're going to be on larger teams and maybe sometimes too big of large teams. But in small business, you might have one, maybe two developers. Um, in that case, I mean, you really should make it, it like a CTF, right? You should be looking for these things. You should be trying to find volumes in your, in your teammates' codes. You should be putting commit messages that are snarky because you found a bug. I mean, that, we, there should be that kind of culture between developers that are making each other better and focusing on doing well. The other thing I don't see enough, too, is our, our just basic co code tests. Um, anytime you find something wrong with your code, you should write a test immediately, validate that that bug shows up in your test, that it fails, and then put that into your production test set. Um, if you do that every time, eventually the number of bugs you have versus the number of tests you have are going to start evening out, and you're not going to be having bugs just because your tests are going to catch them. Uh, and by bug, I mean something that is unexpected, that isn't caught, and that goes to production. If the test catches it and it fails, um, that's, 
that's a success because you're catching things that are easy to miss. That's what a test is for. Um, and for the educator side, I mean, you know, when I was teaching at EMU and uh, you know other people that I, I I work with and have taught other places, I mean, it really does come down to when we're doing proper four-year you know um, education, it doesn't all have to be so high level. I mean, we we should get into more in-depth co content about cause and effect, right? Um, so many things in like business or law, you're going to be told if you do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, this will happen. In comp sci and development, I don't think we hear enough um, your responsibility to a company that you're developing code for is paramount. The, the uh, leverage that you have holding data that is personal, whether it's financial or medical, that is a responsibility you should take very, very, very sacredly because if you don't do a good job, people will suffer. You will suffer. And I think there's just too much of a, like, yeah, things are cool. We write some lines of code. You know, we, might, we make something that looks cool. And it, we just don't pass the, the um, I, I just don't think there's an emphasis in four-year degrees that there are just sitting around on a table like this where we know bad things happen all the time. And maybe it's because there's no security aspect to a web development degree or a comp sci degree in a lot of cases. There should be at least one course that really kind of does that scared straight moment where you see all the bad things that happen, all the stupid mistakes that caused them, and the ways to fix them. I just want to point out that there's, uh, we're starting to be talk about, at least we're starting to talk about developing a uh, secure programming um, focus in IA uh, that would probably you know, take uh, the crypto focus and roll well into that. Well, the, I, I, this is why I recommended last year, not, not that, but that they, so interdisciplinary education in me is the only education that's worth anything in IT. If you're going to do a four-year degree, it should be a mixture of things. Um, I think they should have the IA program um, have reciprocity with the comp sci department, and they teach reciprocal classes as far as they get a secure programming class, the, the comp sci people get a secure networking class, or some combination therein, and you get the other side of the coin and you know, get a real education that's going to mean something. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways. I and that's the thing. Most, most, from having been in faculty and discussion meetings for curriculum, most of those start with what do we want to call this, and then how do we backfill crap in to make that program? It's not what do we want to teach, and then we'll call it something. Right. <laughs> Some days I think there's more bureaucracy, honestly. Um, so legislatively, you know, we talked about the managers and some of the business side of things. Require businesses with the personal information of more than 10,000 customers to implement privacy and data security programs to ensure safety of pertinent data. Okay, that sounds fun. Here's where it comes in that actually matters, right? So when you violate that, $5,000 per violation per day, and maximum $20 million per violation. Um, now, while, yes, you have to enforce that, and our government picks and chooses who it's going to enforce things on, at least if you have that hanging over the person who's managing the programmers, that will make that fire under their ass a lot hotter. That's why I use a credit union. On the big side, yeah, they don't do shit. Yeah. On the small side, the thing the the issue with um, that act is Privacy and security programs implemented is such a broad pull. I can drive a truck through. Absolutely. So we have a policy that says we're going to do more secure, better. Okay, well you've got a problem. Yeah, that the I think the. You know, there's there's no piece to it. Yeah, well I think I th it's it's the actual. Um, I, I I believe at least how what that act when I read it three months ago said that the actual breach that situation by not. Resolving that, that's where the fines start getting levied. It's not that you don't have a security program in place, right. which makes a, you know, a bit more sense. You know, in the same context as the, the crypto laws that have passed in Nevada, Massachusetts, California, um, you know, data at rest, not being encrypted, bad things happen if that ever gets lost. Yeah. So I, I think it's in the same general guise of legislation. Whether or not they're good legislation, at least people are starting to think about, hey, maybe we should make people accountable for things. I printed your 
Yeah. And then you have people like, I don't know, full disclosure and other mailing lists that will make it very error. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't think I don't think anonymous is going to take any uh, you know they're not going to pull any punches at making people look bad anyways, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the industry, um, this is this is where the booze probably should start if you want to. Um, in, in these situations, I'm, I'm sure there's more, or maybe you can refine them, obviously, to be uh, more granular than this even. Uh, people that are working with code, putting applications together, I'm thinking web, you know, because that's kind of the focus of this talk, but maybe it goes deeper. Um, the reason I focus and, and pinpoint web stuff so much is all your internal applications, yes, they're going to have bugs. Yes, they're going to be possibly breached if you write code badly. However, the scope isn't the entire internet. It, there, are, there are other considerations, right, when people can just go to any website at any time from any IP and just see this application. So if we start focusing on these core industries where people's data that will actually affect their lives are held, um, that might be a good start as far as buttoning down some of these horrible uh, situations. And I was so close to removing finance off there when I had to slide it. I wonder if we make I probably wouldn't have. Um, it, it, who, I was when when you said that I was thinking of Rick Perry. Who who, who are we gonna get rid of again? Um, I'm not like Ron Paul is like oh who I don't know, he just said someone arbitrary. He's like yeah yeah that's it yeah. Wait, the the Yelp thing was the best though. Um, so. I, th I think related to the second point related to the first point, um, ethics violations, that's a hard one, right? You know, the CISP tries to wrangle what are ethics and, you know, InfoSec and this and that. Um, I, I think the, yeah, the, the neg negligent, careless work, um, just like any kind of regulation, just like any kind of enforcement, the language there is going to get very messy, very legalese, very quickly to lock down what that actually means. That's not to say we can't try. <laughs> This one might get a boo too. The number of phone interviews I've done recently, because at MNX I was trying to help one of our clients get a new developer. For the last developer, they fired because I told them how bad the code was. Um, the number of interviews I did over the phone, just talking to these people left and right and hearing all their life stories about how they programmed for 20 years and how they know all these languages. The best story I have is I, I talked to one guy and he was the first person that really said like, oh yeah, I know what SQL injection is. I know how to protect it. You do this, this, and this. And I'm looking at his resume, I'm going to these websites, and within like the first five minutes of the conversation, I had SQL injection on his website. <laughs> and it's just like, if this is the guy who knows about SQL injection, these other people couldn't even answer what it is, and he doesn't protect against it in such a blatant way, what hope do we have? Um, now, I would think a lot. <laughs> when that happened. Yeah, I, I actually told him the URL to go to, and I told him what to type in the parameter to see the error come back. I, I mean, yeah, and, and at that point, he, he started backtracking. He said, well, I didn't write all of this code. So other people wrote some of it with me, and I'm like, well, did you write this part? He's like, I really don't remember. <laughs> I've, I've caught that on resumes before, in code samples. Oh, man, people are so dumb. Um, the, 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 the security certification, I don't think it's going to be the catch-all for anything, but I think at the point that you at least pass a certification that made you at least cheat, maybe you'll at least pick up something. Maybe you'll at least learn something. <laughs> yeah. 
we, we all know we we all know that most certifications, as far as like actually proving your competency, is pretty useless. But usually, when you at least have to think about cheating, you at least learn a few things in the process. Anyone that's ever cheated in high school, you know that you started trying to cheat for a test on like you know a little scrap piece of paper, and all the notes you started taking, you started learning the curriculum. It, it happens when people try to do bad things; they learn good things still. So why not make people just pass a stupid exam for fifty dollars? Have something that says, I learned something about security. Well, it's like CompTIA prices. Come on. <laughs> um, CompTIA used to not expire. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so I realize all of these points have holes. All these points are, in, in their practice, hard to do, hard to do right, hard to regulate. It's a matter of things have gotten way too out of hand. It's not so much just to say that these are stupid ideas and they'll never work and people are going to cheat and people are going to lie and people are going to do this and that. But unless we're doing something about it, we're just as guilty as them because we're not regulating this. We're not trying to make things better. We're just saying how bad it is and I wish we could stop that with a laugh. And there really is too much at stake not to. There's just more and more... It sounds like a CNN quote, but there's more and more data going on, on the internet every day, and there's less and less privacy, and people are are putting more out there. And if we're not trying to stop that 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 curve of terror terror that keeps some of us employed, but at the same time, um, it's putting us at risk. The best example I have of this was um, a website that asked me to join for a kind of like an honors thing for college. I went to the website, started filling out this form, you know, click something went to type something in the URL, and it came back with SQL error. From that, it was like one step just to see, like, yes, it comes back with SQL version string. I, at that point, it's like, okay, that's enough. Just let them know that. Here's the thing. On their website, they say, we have people like Hillary Clinton. We have people like X, Y, and Z politician. We have this CEO, that CEO. What you might be interested in knowing is that they take the last four digits of your social security number, and they, and they have those in their database because when you log in it's there. Now whether those four digits are encrypted or not, gee that would be hard. Um, probably not, right? Um, if you have politicians and you have last four social security number, does anyone know how the first five digits are created? Right? It's Yeah, those those first digits, everyone thinks like, oh, you don't have those those the you don't have most of the digits, so these last four are safe. Really the the first five you can enumerate the possibilities and pretty quickly figure out a good range in which they should fall. Uh, the last four are actually the be-all, end-all of that, that number. So you have politicians, you have CEOs, you have the last four of social security number, you have their address info because that's in there, and now this, yeah, exactly. Um, if, you, if you put that small example into context and think of all the other sites that all these other people do, like Snap Fitness, that whole thing I talked about at, at Gurkhan and other conferences, you know, uh, same thing. You had people's um, medical info, you had whether or not they had heart attacks, whether or not they had a pregnancy, if they have if they're diabetic. Um, and then yes, there are CEOs, yes there are this and that and the other thing. There's a lot of info that we treat as, yeah, we're just going to publish it because that's what people require us to publish, but we never say are you treating my data the way I want your, my data to be treated? Um, when it was paper forms, you had to worry about that filing cabinet down the hall from some person in HR, and that was it. Um, now that everything's a, a fucking CRM that people have to publish everything they have into a database and put it on the internet because that's what customers demand, now it's all at risk too. And we're not taking the same leaps and bounds to, I, I should rephrase, we're, we're putting so much effort into making information available to customers and to medical offices and to all these other entities, and we haven't caught up in the um, the emphasis on security at the same rate as we are putting information out there. And these kinds of organizations that I just talked about, I mean, they're all about getting people to join because they make money when you join, even though it's an honorary thing, right? Um, they are worried about making a good impression to how available they are and how easy it's to get on the mailing list and how easy it is to get um, you know, uh, your, your yearly pamphlet from them about all the great things members are doing that they're not thinking about, well, who do we hire to do all this? That's not a concern. Does the who? Do the developers care? Like, I, I work with a whole score of developers. Yeah. I love developers. 
Sure. But I, I was like, hey, you know, I want to poke at one of our simulators. Let me give, give me and a couple of buddies. I was hoping to get you on there. To <laughs> simulators. Yeah. See if I can break it because they're telling something from the army. And they're like, oh no no, we're secure, we're secure. I'm like, yeah, I didn't really doubt it because they're all like, they're like, oh, security sucks. And that's what they, they yeah. you know, I'm I'm hated, but. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't. I don't think they care. And that's the thing is that until they care, they're gonna still make vulnerable crap because they're gonna make five bucks to make it. I, I think one other aspect, if you think of like all the SCADA ICS stuff, to you know, a lot of people are gonna be developing within the context of this is going to be used in such a way. I know how this is supposed to be implemented, and all these air gap networks become a TCP connected network, so the boss can sit at home and make sure that the machine's pushing out widgets. Same thing happens with web apps. We have we have a web server that we helped set up. That web server we know had a you know mod security on it. That one had a WAF in front of it. That one had a SQLs proxy. And then someone moves it because they had to get new hardware. All of that software doesn't get reinstalled. And now all of our all of our preconditions for this being a secure application are now gone. with the Mercedes about this bulletproof car and their, their threat model is people will shoot at you from Mexico or wherever in Mafia town and you'll get blown up. So we'll have this bulletproof car and we'll have it perfect and everything and there were six months from shipping these things out, millions and millions of dollars into the project and that's when 9-11 happened, that's when the war happened. What was the new threat model? IEDs under the car. And that's when they realized they had never put anything to protect the bomb under the car. So their whole threat model was avoided. They wasted all these millions of dollars and they can the whole project. Just because of that. You build when you're a programmer and your idea. I mean my programmers they, they do care about security, they're very conscientious about it. But the minute their model changes, you know, they didn't build for that. And you're right, it introduced them to a whole new world. Well, is there a was a similar one that that the the application was developed because it's gonna be only internal app. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And we don't have to worry about security because it's an internal app. Until somebody says, hey, you know what, this is a great framework. Let's expose it to our customers because they really like it. Right. Now I'll have that to all the time. and move it up the, up the chain. We've got all this internal stuff. We don't have to worry about it. Well, now we've got this business partner here and this business partner there. We've got this SSL VPN. We'll give them access to it that way. That's yeah. why you use that. Turn the entire infrastructure <laughs> outside. Yeah. yeah. And then you put it on the cloud to save some money. I feel the developers around me. I'm like, hey, you guys, do a lot of network traffic. It's like, right. similar, it's like <laughs> I think 50 PCs, they're all talking back. I'm like, if you sanitize what's going across or, you know, you do check, they're like, no, no, no. And I would, they're like, it's never connected to the internet. They don't run antivirus on these Windows boxes that are running simulators in these large police departments. <laughs> kind of funny. And uh, I, I was like, never connect the internet. And I'm like, oh, hold on. My brother works in the support department. Call him, hey. How do you troubleshoot one of the one of the video display units? Oh, we have them plugging into the internet. I'm like, okay, thanks. Hang up. I think I win. Well, I mean, so no, we all lose. We all lose. <laughs>
So let's fix them now. We can run get the order. See, that, that, that's the problem, though, because mistakes, you, you tell yourself, people make mistakes. Even if, even if you try to catch everything in depth, some of it will be in the So if you're driver's liable because of that one mistake, then you're just you're going to go for the possible time. Well, I, I would say that your job shouldn't be liable if you if you went through and done that separate. So to your point, doing review, doing, you know, two-person coding or not. I like what you said about having an industry standard because businesses, being businesses, are always going to do the least possible amount for the bank, you know, biggest bank for the buck. So their sure. security and compliance of it's are always going to be driven down to, okay, how little can we get away with under the law? of the law? So if we can at least have that regulatory hands, have a managerial support behind it, and build that culture where, okay, you're not going to be fired if you did something wrong. You're going to be rewarded for coming forward and fixing it. Well, maybe we need to dig a little bit deeper and go to the point of where everybody is afraid that every mistake is going to count against them. Instead, build on the culture of everybody makes mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. Those who make mistakes and learn from mistakes are going to be the ones recognized. Yes. Because remember the old definition of an expert? That's the guy that's already made all the mistakes. <laughs> and he's like 10,000 hours. <laughs> <laughs> 10,000 hours <laughs> of mistakes. So you would pick, you know, pick on developers or whatever, then that's fine. But if you make a mistake and you're done, are you are you going to go run off to your boss and say, you know what, I made a mistake here? I've done it many times. I, I have too. Well, I mean, I'd yeah. rather yeah. you know fess up than find out later. But do you really want to do that? I mean, I, I hmm. honestly, to be... Be honest, I don't blame the developers for not wanting to bring that up, not wanting to have this conversation because they, you, you look at bad coding or security issues, a bad thing. And I, you know, a hole in my network is a bad thing. You know, you just like switch G, so it's not probably a bad thing, but you, you don't, <laughs> it, it's, how, how many of us who are like, oh, developers, you guys need to secure your code, but really look at you, I, or well, is my web server secure? when I put this up up there. Yeah. You know, it, it falls back on us, too. You know, I, I agree. Oh, yeah. I like having all my ports open on that. <laughs> <laughs> we know. We're yeah, the internet. You, you <laughs> want to make a port over the Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you all right. <laughs> don't, don't, don't derail this yet. No, 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 no. The digression's begun. <laughs> but I think in, in terms of security guys, you got to get out of the whole you know, one breach and you're fired mentality. This is ridiculous. You know, to the, to the point of the, the pharmacist or whatnot, you know, I'm sure if she makes a mistake, she's not canned. That's not the end of her career for her in a day. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, there's definitely always, and again, going back to apples and oranges, um, the, a, a, every mistake has some sort of gravity to it, right? You have small mistakes, you have big mistakes. Um, usually in something like pharmacy, um, that that would be the the amount of yeah. how many people of you guys get regular prescriptions? Badly. Be careful. Uh, the amount of the amount of mistakes. Is she? I, I was just. Well, oh, I'm, I'm. I was just about to say um, the people that are pharmacy techs. You would assume that they have a, maybe a two-year degree. You would assume they have gotten some. Uh, they pull people off the floor at these stores and make them pharmacy techs. As long as you can use. As long as you can use the computer, you can be a pharmacy tech. Um, the 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 reality is, I, this is a very big move off the point, but we can tangent slightly. The reality of uh, is of a pharmacy, the tech is doing most of the work. The job of the pharmacist is to verify that the work the tech did is accurate. So you, sh the the pharmacist is really the unit test before that goes and ships. That that's how that works. Now, yeah. And not all pharmacists are the same, too. It's funny because my wife, there was a fill-in pharmacist where she was at there one day, and because my wife's the pharmacy manager and she's there and the, the owner really trusts her to do her job real well, she said, here, check this medicine in the pharmacy. He's like, well, you do your job. I don't have to. And she's like, well, I'm not giving it to the customer. I'm going to leave it over here until Monday. Well, no, you can't do that. Well, then check it. Yeah. Because, yeah, you know, that's your job. It's her job. It's, she she doesn't want to kill nobody, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, there's. Whoops. Probably. Well, right now, actually, probably. 
And, I mean, that's always going to be a, an analog, right? There's always people that don't give a shit about their job that are doing a bad job, and there are people that care about their job that are trying to do a good job who just happen not to always know exactly every little last thing they should do, which is everyone in this room. Um, you know, we always try to strive to be better, and we should have processes in place to allow us to become better. Um, you know, if you put up web code that has a bug in it, I think the worst thing you could do is lie, say you didn't put it in, say someone else put it in. And I think part of that goes back to audit trails. A lot of people do development. They do it on their own laptop. They ship things to production off their laptop. There's no version control system that's centralized. There's no way to check who committed what where. Um, so I think a lot of that comes back to you have to be able to measure and um, not just measure you know, people doing their job, but also have the accountability behind who's pushing code to production, not that just someone wrote a feature. No security. A lot. Um, so this is this really doesn't apply to you guys very much unless you want it to. Free of charge. There you go. So what's interesting? I mean, I did, to be fair, Infogard wasn't a gigantic event. I mean, I might have had thirty people in my in my talk, but um, surprisingly, no one actually picked me up on this offer. No small business person, no corporation, no you know has a website for their own personal business. Um, you know, so the WC4, if you guys aren't aware, because you might not be in Washington or might not carry, even if you are, uh, it's basically just an organization that has some federal and state money behind it to help imp impress upon people the seriousness of information security, whether you're in education, law enforcement, um, you know, just general business, doing commerce, whatever. And we try to help the people in Washington understand what we can do for you in a way that will make marginal impacts in your business without costing you anything because we care about that. We don't care about charging you just to get it done. So if any of you happen to want people to review your code for free, um, we can try to make that happen. Or if you want to pay for it, go there. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I personally would be able to do Ruby and PHP. Uh, I mean, there are other, are other members that other languages would apply, but yeah. No, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, this is completely a county-centric business and law enforcement-oriented goodwill effort, whereas Hackers for Charity is we're taking care of people around the world in, like, Uganda with our money we donate. Yeah. <laughs> Are they? No, that was that was without borders. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, it was they, they, they were there was that. And then this was my splash screen for the people in the room. You guys all probably know about OWASP. Um, the PHP security book, I, 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 again, I've programmed PHP forever. I know how to program PHP well. I don't think it's a shitty language. I like Ruby a lot more now that I do Ruby. But for people that are doing PHP, there's no reason not to at least get a book to say, like, oh, maybe I could be doing a little bit better of a job with what I'm doing. Uh, and then Symantec's good effort at doing common web apps. Yeah, I mean, OWASP is going to cover what they're covering anyways, but hey. I think part of that reason was people trust Symantec. People don't know what OWASP is, so I was hoping they'd go there if nothing else. And then that's me. So, um, I mean, the, the long and short of it, really, I mean, for you guys especially, is I've, I've seen code where you could put a cookie on your browser and change it to true, and that would make you an admin on a commerce site with credit card numbers for thousands of people. Uh, it, it just, there's, there's no limit to how badly people are going to do their job in any profession, but in web application development specifically, it's very easy to affect people by doing that. Um, so I, again, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know if it is legislation or regulation or um, top-down business management or whatever. But I think that everyone probably can agree that something has to be done because people aren't doing it themselves at a just, I'm a developer here, you know, I'm going to code something. So whatever your role in information security is, whether, you know, your management, whether you're, um, you know, someone on tech staff, someone that might be on a different side of the fence, you know, there's, uh, I, I think a good example is at ePrize when I was there. When I came there, people, the, the best example I have about bad, good, good hired people doing bad job at security they're, they're filling out a form for Coca-Cola, who's ePrize's major client, their number one client. They have a whole team dedicated. And on the form, it was asking, what encryption standard do you use? 
and the response that we, we gave back was SHA-1. And I'm like, no. Well, no, no I mean, no, no. In encryption, not secure hashing algorithm, encryption. And they said SHA-1. And we only hashed it. Yeah, yeah, we're never going to get this back. Um, so it's just one of those things that, that was the security guy who was filling out that form. And so when I got to ePrize, I set up a security mailing list where it would be an alias with a bunch of people at the company. There was a guy that was really good at crypto. There was me who did like web app stuff and general infrastructure. There was a networking guy who liked security a lot. And we basically just said, if you have any questions about security, it doesn't matter if you're a salesperson, it doesn't matter if you're a programmer, it doesn't matter if you're a networking guy, email us and we'll maybe brain trust this together to get you an answer that might be helpful. Um, so those kinds of goodwill effort, even if you're not the security team, even if there's not a security team, that doesn't mean you can't try to facilitate that kind of same abilities between probably very talented people at a company that just maybe aren't on the right team to be security people. You can still make a, a difference where you're working, you know. So that's about it, guys. Thanks for your time.